This is the best of the Rocker Morning Show with Meatball and Mark. Eli, you're on with Mark and Meatball. Hey, guys. Good morning. How's it going, man? How are you? Morning, buddy. I'm doing good. Doing really good. Well, welcome to the Rocker Morning Show, Eli Roth. Uh, you're known for Cabin Fever, all the Hostel films, uh, Death Proof. You played Donnie the Bear Jew in Inglorious Bastards. Great movie. And now, new anthology series, Urban Legends, out on the Travel Channel and Discovery Plus. Uh, again, welcome to the show. Are you are you a believer in the urban legends out there? Oh, I mean, when I was 12 years old, absolutely. <laughs> that, was, that was the fun of urban legends before the internet in the 80s was like, you swore that you knew someone who knew someone that that happened. Whether it was, you know, so, like some kid's older brother would be like, no, I know this girl. And she got a Doberman for security, and then the Doberman was choking, and then she took it to the vet and left it, then went back home. The vet called her and said, get out of your house. We found what's in the dog's throat. It was human fingers. There's a murderer in your house. Like, oh, man. Like, yeah. no way. It's like, yeah, then the killer tried to get her. So that was the criteria for the story. <laughs> like, no, my dude, my friend was walking through a forest, and then they looked up in the trees, and there was a burned scuba diver. And he'd been sco- scooping in a lake, and there was a fire. And the Bambi basket picked him up and dumped him in the fire, and he burned to death in the tree. And you're like, oh, what? <laughs> it sounded so crazy, but like you know, like waking up in the bathtub with your, you know, waking up after the date and your kidneys are gone. Um, the organ harvesting, which is the most famous one. I yeah. love those stories, and you know, kind of over the years with sites like Snopes, you know, that was when they started <laughs> to get debunked to trace the origin of where they started and right. what was, you know, what was the origin of this, but. The producers of the film series came to me and they said, do I want to continue this as, you know, as anthology horror, like Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone? I said, absolutely. Are you kidding me? I'd love to. So, you know, Travel Channel, Discovery Plus, they let me go nuts. They said, you can make them scary, make them violent. We found these incredible new filmmakers. And my one stipulation was, I was like, where I think these, these shows start to not be scary is when you can tell they're stretching it to fill out the time. Right. And I said, why don't we just cut it for whatever is the tightest, scariest, half hour, whether it's 29 minutes or 31 minutes, because that makes a big difference in horror. And then whatever extra time, it'll just be me interviewing the directors. So there are all these, and they said, great. So I have this little segment called Filmmaker to Filmmaker, where I spotlight the director of the episode. It's like, it's almost like a DVD extra. Like, yeah. you watch the episode, it's really scary, it's over, and then you go right into interviewing the director about how they did it and what their influences That's were. So, so great. It's, it's, it allows me to make the best scariest show possible that's smart and it's a unique take on the idea as well what are some of your favorite urban legends i mean i loved i was a big into organ harvesting i mean that was really <laughs> even with a hospital i was trying to think of like well why are they killing people is it for organs like no nah, it's too urban legend like that that one was always great that one was one of my favorite i loved um you know that the choking doberman was a big one and the scuba diver in the tree were, were yeah. some of my favorites obviously but then the idea of red room really scared me the idea of people paying to kill other people watching it online like and you get a message that says like are you in the red room you can't get out of it like once targets you you can't stop so um those are some of my favorites but i remember that that, like the whole thing of the kidneys and the bathtub full of ice always freaked me out like you're on a date you wake up and your organs have been harvested (laughs) that was like that one i swore was real now these are all like kind of like really do it yeah, yeah. These are these are all kind of essentially, like you said, mini horror films. You know, that about somebody experiencing these urban legends. Are these based on real ones, or are they they all kind of made up of fictional ones? No, we went for the real ones. Okay. I wanted the classics. I mean, there there's like you know encyclopedias of you know three hundred urban legends, and some of them just don't really feel like they'd make an interesting story. Uh-huh. And then other ones like you know the girl buys the prom dress that is haunted and she puts it on and starts to see the ghost of the girl who died in it. Like we, I tried to mix them up. Some are ghosty, some are like straight stalkery, some are like body horror, some are survival horror. Um, but I wanted to go like take new takes on like whatever were the classic urban legends, whether they had been done before or not. We have fantastic writers and directors. And we thought like, what's a cool new way into the story while honoring the urban legend and just doing a great, great version of it. Sure. And that's kind of the fun is that I was like, people are going to know the story. So they're going to wait for that classic moment to happen, whether it's the haunted shower or the creep in the walls, the girls move into a house that they inherited and no one's lived there for a while and they're fixing it up and they feel like someone's watching them. And there's been like a scary guy living inside the wall. Oh, yeah. Watching them and perving on them. Like, oh, man. Okay, and Kat Hostick directed that episode. It's <laughs> so good and it's so creepy. 
So it was just picking ones that were already exist, but just like doing a really, really fantastic, terrifying version of it. Fantastic. I mean, I love anthology horror. I love sitting down and getting a mini movie that's just like half an hour. You can just get a great, great dose of scary. And so far, the response has been awesome. People are loving it. That's yeah. great to hear, man. Yeah. And you've been part of some incredible films as well, one of which was The Cabin in the Woods, which took probably the most unique approach on the traditional horror movie that we've ever seen. I mean, where was that idea born from? Well, that one was uh, Cabin Fever was mine. Cabin in the Woods was actually playing on all the tropes of the Cabin movies. You're right. But weirdly, they watched Cabin Fever. Like, uh, Joss Whedon, who wrote it, told me that when they were making that movie, like the first 20 minutes of the movie, in fact, the cabin in Cabin in the Woods, the interior of it looks like shockingly similar wow. to Cabin Fever. But okay. I, I really enjoyed that movie. I mean, to me, Cabin Fever was taking the different horror tropes and killing the kids out of order, where right. the nice guy kills the girlfriend. Like, everyone thinks that they have the movie figured out from the first 10 minutes and then completely flipping it on its head. <laughs> that was the fun of the movie. Taking all the classic stereotypes of that and then killing people in the wrong order and having people do things that you weren't expecting them to do in a horror movie. Right, right. So, and not just a producer as well. You do some acting, obviously some bigger roles like Donnie and Inglorious Bastards. Uh, but a lot of your stuff is quick cameos or uncredited roles. Is there a certain appeal to those little roles specifically that keeps bringing you back to them? Totally. It's my friends directing it and they go, hey, you want to pop in? Or like sometimes they'll show up on set and just visit them on set and they're like, here, put this on. And they throw you in the movie. <laughs> That's what happened to me before. And then I'm like, oh, God. Then it's on IMDb and you're like, this wasn't, spo- it's not, uh, this wasn't supposed to be an acting thing. Um, <laughs> like Alex Aja, who I'm friends with. I love Alex. I love Hills Have Eyes. I really love Crawl. I mean, when he called me and said, do you want to like get, you do like the sort of wet t shirt contest host who yeah. dies like a horrible death in Piranha 3D. I was like, of course I'm going to do that. It's, <laughs> it's fun. It's like a movie that I want to be a part of. Um, and then the classic thing is like on this HBO show that's going to be out in June called The Idol, where Sam Levinson's the director and it's like, hey, come by and, and do this part. And I can't say anything about it specifically, but it, it just grew and grew and grew. But it's basically like if I really love the director yeah. and I feel like I can bring something great to it, then I'm, I'm happy to do it. As long as it's not taking away from my directing career. Directing is always going to come first, but I really do love acting. That makes sense. You you mentioned the IMDB. I think one of the funniest credits is in uh, Southland Tales, <laughs> uncredited role, man who gets shot on the toilet. <laughs> Classic. But that's, Rich Kelly and I were writing a movie together, and it was after I made Cabin Fever and after he made Donnie Darko, and he's like, I'm making this movie, and I had read the script, and I was so excited for him. He's like, He's like, I want to kill you in it. I'm like, yeah, sure. So I show up. He's like, this toilet's like really disgusting. He's like, sorry, you got to sit on this. They squib me up. And then I'm like, what should I be reading? I'm like, should I have like a porn? Like, no, there's a gardening magazine. Like, I'm reading a gardening magazine. <laughs> He's like, we got one take. And I had to time it where the guys bust in and poof, like, yeah. you got to time your death to the squibs going off. And we did it. And I just like did this death and just sat there with my eyes open. And the change went home. I mean, that was it. It was so much fun. Oh. But that's the classic thing that I'd want to do um, where, you know, I'm friends with the director and I go by the set and he's shooting with The Rock and Sean William Scott. And, you know, we, we had a great time. And then, and then you see it or like even Clown, which I produced. Yeah. John Watts is like, we got to have you as like the creepy Saturday morning. Kids just you go there and you put right. on the makeup. It's, it's the same spirit as like when you're, when I was like 11 years old, I got a video camera. When I had a Super 8 camera and I was like 9 or 10, like, let's go shoot a thing. And now you're going to play that and you'll be the psycho and you'll be the magician and you'll be this, you'll be the monster. It's that same kind of energy. It's like it, it never changes. Right. I got one more question for you before we let you go. Now, obviously, we've covered a lot of this. You know, your filmography reads, you know, of that who's who. It was some of the biggest horror and thriller titles in the past couple of years. So clearly you're a fan of the spooky and scary stuff. Full 180. Mm-hmm. Would you ever consider doing a children's movie one day, like if Pixar came calling? I mean, I did it with House of the Clock in its wall. That's right. I did a kid's horror movie. I did it. PG. And I made sure, I was like, this cannot be PG-13. It has to be pure PG. I wanted to do Beetlejuice or Gremlins. Yeah. Or like, because everyone said, when are you going to make a movie my kids can watch? And and we need gateway horror movies. You know, like when you're a kid and you watch Escape from Witch Mountain, like you've got to have a movie that you can show like a seven, eight, nine year old to give them that thrill of being scared in a safe way, but not traumatizing them. You know, I saw the exorcist when I was six. I mean, it's like, and it's traumatized. I mean, like as Tarantino says, violence doesn't 
violent movies don't cause violence, they cause violent filmmakers. And I'm like a case study in that. Yeah. But I, you, you got to have a movie that kids can watch, that they enjoy, that gets them excited and kind of into horror and for the spooky season. And no one was doing straight up PG horror, not theatrically. Yeah. So that was the challenge was like, I want to be scary and creative in a PG way and do something for kids. And it was really cool because it was based on a house nearby us in Marshall, Michigan, which was really freaking sweet. And again, excellent. Yeah. Film. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Would, would you ever consider doing like a children's edition of like green Inferno? You think that would work? <laughs> I did a family friendly version of cabin fever and put it on the DVD. And it's like 12 seconds. Like <laughs> so I, yeah. So I, I did try to cut a G rated version of my horror film. And made it like 15 seconds long. But yeah, uh, I love this movie. You know what? If it's a good movie, why not? If it's a challenge. I mean, look, do you ever see babe, the pig in the city? Oh, right. Absolutely. Remember, that was the director of Road Warrior who made Babe. Then oh, he made that's right. Pig in the City is a disturbing film. Yeah. Yeah. There's a scene where, like, a dog, a bulldog's almost choking to death. It's G-rated, but, like, kids were crying in the theater. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is the director of Road Warrior, Mad Max, Fury <laughs> yeah. Road, making a kid's movie. I'm like, this is awesome. I loved it, but I was like, this is a dark movie. Well, it's disturbing. Yeah, I, love, I mean, dude, loving the anthology series Urban Legend. It's on Travel Channel, airing now. New episodes Friday night, 10 o'clock. Eli Roth, really appreciate your time today, dude. It was great talking to you. Thank you. And Discovery Plus, if you have that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Discovery Plus. Thank you, well, Eli. Thanks, guys. Live weekday mornings from 6 to 10 and on demand in the Rocker app. It's the best of the Rocker Morning Show on 1077 RKR.